impact. I tried not to think what would happen to her body. I tried to remember, remind myself that it, she wasn't going to need it anymore. Shoving water, rations, and water ammo I could fit in my backpack, I crawled out from under the ruined window we'd been sheltering under. A nearby whaling started as soon as I got to my feet. It, there had already been a pack in the area when the shot had gone off. I had been careless not to have checked first. I pulled out a ration packet, split it open, dropping the contents across the entrance of the makeshift burrow that had under the wing. If that got their attention, then the smell of blood would surely drive them inside, or I body that. They'd spend precious moments trying to dig their way underneath, moments I could use to put as much distance between myself and the men as I could. I only hoped they weren't in the mood for a hunt. But if they were, I'd be seeing my recently dispatched wife very shortly. I'm not the monster you think I am. She and I had a pact when this whole mess started. Neither of us leaves the other to be taken by the horrors that now roam our world. The ones who didn't eat you alive uh, were the ones who incorporated you into their bloated, lumbering physiologies. She'd been afraid of those the most and often said she'd rather be dead than exist as one as part of one. I'd obviously taken her seriously. I ran as quickly I ran as quietly as I could, but without sacrificing speed. The sounds behind me told me they found her and my desperate ploy to work. They were trying to tear their way into our former hiding place. If I could just make it another block, I'd be able to find a place to hide. But that would take a miracle, and I'd just shot my guardian angel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Baptism by fire, and man, you did well. Well done. All right, so second reader for this evening is going to be Piri Eddy. Piri is a consummate slasher. By that, I mean that he is good at many, many things. He is a writer, slash actor, slash musician, slash comedian, slash creative director. Most recently, he was also the writer in res residence at the South Australian Writers' Centre, and that is where I met him. Please come up to the stage. Barry Eddy. in the plain of flat grass and the wind picks up so that it whistles in your ear like a screeching spectre. The watcher sits on the floor of the tower with his rifle leaning up against the railings. He runs a dry tongue across a cigarette paper and carefully sticks the two ends together and rolls his cigarette. The watcher places the thin stick between cracked lips and fumbles in his jacket pocket for his lighter. One, two, three clicks later and his face is momentarily lit in the fading light. He spends a ponderous moment staring at the flickering flame that stares right back at him. Then he brings it up to his face, cups a gloved hand around his cigarette and the flame and uh, around his, his cigarette and the flame and lights the tip. One long drag and the eye blazes red, and he pushes out a puff of smoke. The smoke crawls like tendrils from his open mouth and weaves up into his nose. The watcher puts the lighter back into his pocket and stretches out his legs until they touch the other side of the tower. The tower is a small enclosed box, windowless, with a slanting tin roof and standing on thick wooden stilts. The watcher smokes his cigarette and listens to the drum of the rain on the tin roof. Night falls without notice. The clouds are so thick they make the world stand in half darkness anyway. The rain keeps falling but it eases up a bit and the watcher stands leaning up against the railing rolling a fresh cigarette around his mouth. The rifle sits next to it, cold as the night. The watcher zips up his jacket all the way to the neck and shuffles on his feet to keep warm. He fin finishes his cigarette and chucks it over the side of the rail. Morning fly finds the planes covered in a blanket of fog, clouds so low they stick to the watcher's jacket in little rolling drops. He wipes the sticky wet from his forehead and peers through the shroud. The watcher hears the faint thudding of feet before he can even see anything. He picks up his rifle and slides back the chamber rests the butt on his shoulder and holds the forestock in his right hand. 
He positions his right eye behind the sight and closes his left. The index finger of his left hand curls around the trigger. It barely quivers. The watcher stands, stands so still he might be mistaken for a statue up there at the tower. The fog is thick in the distance, but he can hear the stamping of feet coming closer. In the early morning mist, a bird issues a shrill call from somewhere. Below on the plain, a single figure emerges from the mist. A woman, wrapped in loose fitting clothing, face and arms exposed, feet sinking into the mud. The watcher adjusts the rifle by tilting its light, corrects his aim. The woman looks up at the tower, at the face hidden behind the side of the rifle. For a second, they must be looking into each other's eyes. Then there is the crack of the whip, and the woman drops to the ground as if her soul has been sucked out in an instant. He knows that look. The look the woman had before the watcher sucked the soul right out of her. He has seen it so many times before, and he closed his eyes, and he can still see that look. Like it is playing on the repeat beneath his eyelids. The wide eyes, thin line of the mouth pulling down into the corners. Fear, total annihilating fear. He could recognise that look on anyone anywhere because he sees that look almost every day. There is a memory. The watcher recalls it most nights as he sits sucking smoke down his lungs. Mid morning light falling across his bed in slattered rows, watching the dust that is caught in the columns of sunshine flitter lazily without purpose. The sweet smell of her hair in his face, it itches his nose and he pushes it away. Her soft skin on his, uh, her skin soft on his, he rubs his thumb over a mole in her arms and he could erase it. What are you thinking, she says. Nothing. Nothing? Why should I need to think of anything to say, he says. So think of me. Okay. The watcher sees that look five more times before the sun sets. There is no rain today. Usually they don't come when it is clear. Usually they wait until the sky cracks open and it rains until the plains disappear under a shimmering lake. Or after, when the clouds hang so low the watcher can barely hold his hand before his face is still seated. But things are getting worse, so they have to come. What else is there to do? It is still three weeks before the watcher is relieved of his post. Three more weeks in the tower watching the plains like a bird might watch its prey from far above with piercing eyes that reach further than would seem possible. There are two hatches in the floor of the tower. One opens up to the ladder that leads down to the plains. The other to a small compartment filled with dried and canned foods. When the watcher is hungry, he opens the hatch and pulls out a can of apricots. He splits the lid and sends cold, dewy, the gooey juice down his chin. When the watcher sleeps, it is only in fitful bursts. If he sleeps too long, he might miss something on the plane, except so far he's never let any of them through. If they get through, then they might infect others, people who are relying on them. The watcher can't sleep because the people in the town need him to always be awake, so he only ever sleeps for minutes at a time. The watcher remembers the music. On cold nights when the wind barely blows and the rain is soft on the tin roof, he can conjure tiny snippets of music in his head. Grand symphonies of delicate refrains, music that soars like so many angels beating their wings. The rain plays a scattered rhythm over the top, a syncopated accompaniment that he has to consider. Every so often as he plays the melody in his head, the rain synchronizes perfectly, if only for a beat, and then it skitters off again in a different direction. Then the rain and the wind picks up again and he can't hear the music anymore. Most things are forgotten. He had to forget because survival counted on only remembering what was worthwhile. History always has a way of forgetting something. If the things that had been were lost, then what was seemed easier somehow. The watcher clings to some memories because forgetting them would be too painful, would mean he would die because without them, all. The people in the town had forgotten almost everything, even how it all began. The watcher didn't know what those he shot down on the plains remembered. Probably nothing. He never had a chance to ask. His memory. She is sitting in the kitchen and the radio is on. He only catches garbled snippets with his head in the fridge getting the milk. When he looks up, she is sitting there with wide eyes and a mouth a thin line that pulls down at the corners. She is afraid. What is it? The end, she says. In the little box under the hatch with all the canned foods is a photo of her, faded second, tattered at the edges. She smiles at him with pearly teeth and he cries every time he pulls it out. He sits with his back on the walls of the tower, his rifle resting at his feet and he weeps with shattering breaths until it hurts. Then he puts it back in and closes the hatch. If he forgets, then he might as well be dead. The crows don't get diseased. 
They hack and gnaw at the bodies on the plains and strip them bare until they're left to bake in the heat of the sun. He watches them from the tower, with a cigarette rolling around his mouth. The murder squawks and circles and picks the flesh clean. Once or twice he feeds the crows the last bit of food from a can. They hop cautiously along the railing and tip their heads inquisitively. The watcher finds himself smiling when the crows take the food from his outstretched hand and flap away. They don't seem sick at all. It mustn't affect animals. The rain falls in great big sheets and the wind picks it up so it stings the watcher in the face. His cigarette gets too damp and sodden and he spits it out. Underneath the howling wind he hears the running feet and grabs the cold muzzle of the rifle and lifts it to his shoulder. The planes stretch out beneath the tower and end in a huddled line of trees some 300 metres away. The watcher closes his left eye and peers through the sight. There are two men who have passed the line of trees and are running haggard across the grass. He doesn't wait to see their faces. He doesn't want to see that look again. Not this time. The watcher readjusts his line, swallows, and his rifle cracks twice in quick succession. The men crumble. It is like the weight of the rain has suddenly pushed them down. They don't get back up. The last time he saw her, she is in bed with her hands tied to the sides to stop her pulling at her own skin. When he walks in, she looks up at him and smiles without parting her lips. Her eyes shine in the light of the bedside lamp, and he has to grab the door frame because otherwise he'll slump to his knees, his legs are that weak. Let's make this quick. Okay, he says. He sways for a second on elastic legs and then stumbles to her side. Her breathing is short and shallow, her skin glistens with sweat, and the welts all over her body are red even in the same darkness. She looks him right in the, eye, uh, right in the face behind wet eyes, and this time smiles enough to show her pearly whites. Look at me, she says. I can't. He stands next to her with his head bowed, and sobs uncontrollably, his whole body shaking with every shuddering breath. She starts to cough terribly, and then he looks up, and they both look at each other. I can't do this anymore. I need you to do it. But maybe it will get better. You could get better. You know that isn't true. You're right. He combs her hair back with quivering fingers. He leans forward and kisses her forehead and tastes her salty skin on his cracked lips. I should have gotten sick, not you. Why can't I get sick instead? Because I wouldn't have the strength to do it. If only you did, she says. They stay there for a while, him sitting half on the bed, laying slumped across her, with his face resting on her forehead listening to each other breathe. Eventually, she says, put on some music for me. He gets up and crosses the room to the record player. He picks up the cardboard sheet and slides out a dusty vinyl. Then he places it on the record player, sliding the record into place. He picks up the arm of the player and carefully places the stylus on the delicate grooves of the record. He switches it on and the sound drifts quietly out through the crack of the speakers. He returns to her bed where she is listening to the soft music with a lazy smile on her face. That's nice. Untie me. Put your arms. It's okay. I won't have to hold off for long. His hands are shaking, but he manages to unfasten her arms from the bed and she lifts her hand gingerly like she's using them for the first time. She, stop, she holds out her hands to him, palm up, and he takes them in his. They are warm. He can feel the rough contours of her skin. He stands tracing the lifelines on her hands until he reaches the end. Some things we just have to accept, she says. I don't want to have to accept it. You have to. Okay. I love you, she says. He lets her hand drop and she lets him slide out of the pillow she is resting her head on. Her eyes are wide and her mouth a thin line that pulls down at the corners when he paces the pillow gently over her face. The watcher has killed more people on the plains than he cares to count. Once he could remember their faces, cold and starved, but then they just became a loose imagination. A mesh of features altogether lost to no one. He has to forget them if he is to survive. It is the middle of the day and the sun hangs in the middle point of his curvature like a gleaming face looking down at the earth. He has to keep watching because now they come at all times of the day, no matter what the weather. His rifle stands popped up beside him, just out of reach, but he can get it in an instant because it is almost an extension of himself. He is smoking a cigarette in the hot heat and the red tip of it is like a miniature burning sun. He grabs a cigarette and flicks it, and the ash at the end of the cigarette crumbles and gets caught up in the breeze. Then he stubs the cigarette out on the railing of the tower and extinguishes the miniature sun. When he looks up, there are five people running across the field towards the tower. The watcher has his rifle now in his hands. He rests it on his shoulder and fingers the trigger. The watcher glances through the sight, and the rifle issues four cracks 
the body's strong. He shifts his rifle again.